In what appears to be a running theme, 2022 was a year dominated by smaller titles instead of big bombastic romps. While there's a conversation to be had between Supergiant has been making games for a decade now indie and two people spearheading their first independent venture on a budget of £3.50 indie, it definitely feels like this is the direction video games are headed. I remember when people would controversially put games like Papers, Please or FTL Fast Than Light in their end of year list, whereas nowadays I can hear Phil from Pixel Lit proudly proclaim that one of his favourite games from last year is a game that I've never heard of before, where you pilot a submarine in an ocean of blood. It's very likely that if I say the words Neon White, Tunic and Immortality, you'll have played one of these games, or at the very least know what they're about. You've seen people talk about them. And that's the key thing, you've seen people talk about them. I've seen people talk about the case of the Golden Idol a lot. For many people it's on their coveted end of year list. It's an indie darling. It's not got quite the same notoriety as something like Neon White, but people still like it. People are still talking about it. There's two nebulous concepts when we talk about a video game. The first one is the video game, and the second is the not video game, the thing surrounding the video game. A big part of that is the quote-unquote discourse about a video game. Usually I don't care about the discourse surrounding a game, I don't talk about it. I'd rather just talk about the game, or like, what I had for lunch. I went to Subway. But this time around, my criticisms of the case of the Golden Idol aren't really criticisms of the game, it's criticisms of how we talk about the game. All this vague preamble is to say, I really liked the case of the Golden Idol and I thought it was a really good video game that I recommend you play. The problems I had were born from my end of the relationship, my expectations of what I thought this game was going to be. I've seen games journalists, developers and Steam reviews say something to the effect of this is one of the best detective games I've ever played, and I went in with that mindset. As I was playing through though, something was nagging at me. Something felt a little off. It slowly began to dawn on me. The case of the Golden Idol is not a detective game. The case of the Golden Idol takes you from diorama to diorama. In each scene, someone has died and it's up to you to piece together the information frozen in time to find out what happened. As you go about the scene, you gather a collection of words. Once you're done investigating, you have to fill out a little story with these words that proves you know what happened. Now, this first of all probably sounds a bit familiar, and second definitely sounds like a detective game, right? Like, I don't want to be the genre police, I'm not too concerned about the definition, it's sort of a know it when I see it kind of thing. But nonetheless, I did watch the first 10 minutes of a GDC talk from Inkle's John Ingold about deduction mechanics for detective games, and he describes the detective game loop as follows. There's the discovery, where you find out a thing, the deduction, where you think about a thing, and the action, where you've proven that you've thought about the thing. Not like John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, like a, a, a piece of information. And if you've played Golden Idol or paid attention to the first three minutes of this video, you'll know this fits the bill. It's brilliant. Look, I'll spoil the very first case, it takes like five minutes, you're not missing much here. But as you can see, a man has pushed another man off of a cliff, and the game wants you to figure out who is who. We can see from the falling man's pockets that he's a doctor. He has some medicine and a scalpel. From the agreement here, we can see the doctor is Oberon Geller and the not doctor is Albert Cloudsley. Man being pushed is Geller, man doing the pushing is Cloudsley. The game also wants us to tell it where on earth they are, and we can see from the map in the doctor's pocket, along with the two small islands, that we're at the Horn of Thumb. Brilliant. A cool series of deductions here. This is a great detective game so far. Every case is like this. Look, there's a man who has died in bed, and then another man who is on fire. Now this man is on fire for a good reason. A reason you either know if you've played the game or will find out if you go and play after watching this. At this moment in time, the reason why this man is on fire is a mystery. A mystery you can solve, much like the mystery of the dead man in the bed and the mystery of the doctor being pushed off of a cliff. Now, these three cases are connected, but here's my smoking gun. The overarching narrative of the case of the Golden Idol, what happens in the case of the Golden Idol, what mystery are you solving? No, seriously, what is the big mystery in the case of the Golden Idol? What are you trying to find out? Look, I even did the transparency thing of printing out reviews of the game and circling stuff in black ink, and while allusions to the mystery were made, none of them said what it actually was. Like, okay, I have a few theories. 
Is it the mystery of the Golden Idol itself? Well, not really, it's a lightsaber, or like a, a turf stick. It does magical things, it sets people on fire, hint hint. The game actually does explicitly tell you much of the idol's capabilities, but I didn't really want to know. Like, it's a magical doodad. Okay, maybe the mystery of Golden Idol is to find out how all of these scenes are connected, but that idea doesn't really sit with me. Think about the mystery of Return of the Obra Dinn. The mystery is, well, the return of the Obra Dinn. It can be summed up as missing ship has returned, everyone has disappeared, find out where they've all gone. So that's that squared away. What about the mystery of immortality? Well, Marissa Marcel has disappeared, go through our old films to find out what happened. Okay, last one. What about the mystery of outer wilds? You're caught in a time loop and the sun is exploding, suns don't usually do that. Find out why the sun is exploding. Bit of a genre radicalist with that last one there, but hopefully you see what I'm getting at, in that that was incredibly easy for me to do, to answer the question of what is the mystery for all of these games. The issue I take with the mystery of Golden Idol being connect all of these events together is that it's a bit crap? That's not a good mystery, it's not very intrinsic, there's no real inciting incident, it's just a string of events. The turns that Golden Idol takes are either so radical that there's no way you can predict that's what was going to happen, or so obvious that it's literally just the next event in the chain. Like, okay, this guy, I'm just gonna say that he's this guy because I don't want to give too much away, but you might argue that the big mystery of Golden Idol is figuring out who this guy is. You have to know who this guy is in order to solve the final case, and it's something that you pick up on as they appear throughout the game. Now, not to be mean to anyone, but his identity is pretty obvious. Like, if I'm being mean, then I'm being mean to myself too, because I only figured it out until the last case, but I didn't feel smart for doing so. I felt stupid for only just making the connection. If the question, who is this guy, was explicitly asked to the player early on, like halfway through the game, if it was required to progress, I think a lot of people would manage to figure it out. It was something that brewed in the back of my mind, but because it wasn't the main task at hand, I ignored it. The narrative of the case of the Golden Idol doesn't feel like a mystery. It feels like, and bear with me here, I know I've taken some dramatic turns on this channel before, but it feels like unpacking. Yeah, that's right, unpacking. I bet uh, the two of you who have played this game are like, oh yeah, unpacking. Uh, for the rest of you, unpacking is a game about... <laughs> It's so dumb. It's just such a dumb joke. You go through stages of a person's life, from childhood, adolescence, college, you get the idea, and put all of the little furniture where it needs to go, or at least where the game thinks it needs to go. Why it doesn't let me put the kettle on the worktop is a mystery to me. Apparently people in Brisbane, Australia just like to put the kettles, like, as far out of reach as humanly possible. But like, obviously this isn't really the game. If unpacking had you move from room to room, putting crap on shelves, it wouldn't be as good as it is. You see, unpacking is about a human being and their entire life story. You find out what kind of person this person is, what their hobbies are, how they moved into someone's apartment and it was clearly too small for them and it didn't work out, how they bounced back and moved into a place that was clearly better for them. None of it is explicitly laid out before you, but you're still picking up on it and putting it on the shelf of, of your brain. <laughs> this is what I think the case of the Golden Idol is like. If I had to describe it, I'd call it a point-and-click deductive puzzle game, where its puzzles are backed by its narrative as motivation for the player to keep playing. They're not chasing any kind of central mystery, they're on a roller coaster, where they might be able to see where it's going next, or equally they might not know what's around the corner. I don't actually know how um, roller coasters work. If this sounds a little familiar to you, by the way, then congratulations on watching movies. Yeah, we've had this conversation before with Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery, because, like, it's the same thing. A lot of people out there, and no, I'm not counting Ben Shapiro in this, didn't enjoy the movie because they were expecting a murder mystery and got something completely different instead. Glass Onion is not a good murder mystery. It hides information from the viewer and the mystery itself is, well... It's just dumb! And no, acknowledging that your own mystery is dumb uh, does not make it not dumb. But it does make for a good movie, which is what I was expecting. I actually enjoyed Glass Onion because, to me, it wasn't a murder mystery movie. It was a sit down with the family over Christmas and watch Daniel Craig do the worst southern accent imaginable like even me, an English person, can tell something is off movie. I simply wasn't expecting a good mystery, so I didn't feel bad when it turned out it wasn't. So now it's my turn to ask the questions. Why? Why have we done that? I don't know why I'm doing it in a, in a Benoit Blanc voice, it's probably because I was just talking about Glass Onion.
Why have we done this? Why do we think the case of the Golden Idol is a detective game? Because sure, I could go on all day about how I don't think it is, but that doesn't stop all of these other people from saying the opposite. Why did this happen in the first place, and why is everyone absolutely insisting that this game is like Return of the Opa Din? Now, if you remember, I made a snide remark earlier. Okay, that doesn't narrow it down. I made a snide remark when describing the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of the Golden Idol, and how it probably sounds a bit familiar along with some extremely subtle choice of footage. The developers don't try to hide it, they see the case of the Golden Idol as a spiritual follow-up to Return of the Oba Din. And from a mechanical perspective, I would agree that dioramic, that's definitely a word, nature of the cases along with the filling in the blanks as to what happened makes some pretty apt comparisons indeed. But if you were to ask, okay Harry, with all of this said, do you consider Return of the Oba Din Do you consider Return of the Oba Din a detective game? I would say, Yes, it is. In fact, there's quite a bit separating these two games. Not just because the aforementioned big mystery is there for the player to solve, but also in the way it presents it. That is to say, in a non-linear fashion. In Return of the Oberdin, the end is shown at the beginning. It's the fallout from all of the events that take place in the game. The events that you'll piece together as you slowly but surely comb through every memento mortem. You're not solving the murder of this guy to solve the murder. You're doing it to get closer to solving the mystery. Because of the case of the Golden Idol's linear narrative, the motivation for solving each of these cases is intrinsic. You can only see where it goes. If you wanted to turn the case of the Golden Idol into a detective game, and just to clarify, I think the case of the Golden Idol is a really good point and click game with an excellent narrative that is not only not a detective game, uh, but shouldn't be, you could try messing around with the chronology. Start with a and all of a sudden you've got a big mystery to solve. Again, I'm not saying you should do this, it would ruin a lot of the surprises in Golden Idol's narrative, but that's how Oberdin does it. Another difference we can establish between these two games is the protagonist. Oberdin has one, whereas Golden Idol doesn't. But there's a bit more to it than that. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Oberdin is grounded in its world. The little pocket watch and book where you write things down is real within that world. What's that called? I think it's... it's dia diegesis? I think it's diegesis, I don't know, I'm not a smart person, I'm not looking it up. Golden Idol's big mystery machine exists outside of the game's world. The player exists outside of the game's world. You get to sort of peer into Mario 64-like paintings in order to poke around. Now, this is even more subjective than the rest of the video, but I was surprised to see just how many people said the game made them feel like a detective. This game didn't make me feel like a detective, not just from the lack of a central mystery, but also from the lack of player involvement. Step into the shoes of an 18th century detective, says the website. Well, what detective? There's no detective in this game. What shoes? I certainly didn't feel like a character in this world. I felt like an outsider. And sure, a detective is a job role, maybe that's what people mean, but in that case, I want the whole hog. I want to go through the entire detective process where like, I interview suspects and stuff and not just make deductions. It's a very small distinction, but Oberdin, with the luxury of its protagonist and its groundedness in the world, does make me feel like a detective because, hold for surprise, I'm playing as one. Now it's time to get their freshly printed documents back out and answer the question I've asked at the start of this bit. Obviously, some people who have made these Oberdin comparisons are not talking about what I've just talked about. Indeed, many of these reviews say something like, the matching of names to faces reminds me of Oberdin, and that's obviously fine, as the games are similar in the sense of how you play them. But I think the mistake that others have made, the reason why people have called this game a detective game and made the comparisons to Oberdin, is by equating the mechanics to the entire game. Which is where you get a statement such as like, oh, it's like Return of the Oberdin. End quote. This feels a little careless to me. I think you need to keep going, like, oh, it's like Return of the Oberdin in that you X, Y, Z. I think we need to be a little more deliberate when we talk about video games. As they start to experiment and really push the boundaries of genre, we need to be careful about putting games in boxes that they don't belong in. I get it, I really do. This isn't to besmirch the work of games critics. The case of the Golden Idol is the most featherless biped I've ever played. I couldn't figure out what my deal was with the game until I was about halfway through, and even then it took a while for me to ruminate on it, which is a luxury that these critics don't have. And ultimately, this isn't a bad thing. While it might not be what I wanted, the existence of the case of the Golden Idol isn't a bad thing. Having a game come out that goes beyond classification and yet still be enjoyable is a great thing. I want more games to do this, more games that make me think about them in the way that I've thought about this one. In the previously mentioned interview with the Golden Idol developers about how Oberdin heavily inspired the game, they talk about how there were no followers from Oberdin's success. And obviously, I think the case of the Golden Idol has failed in that regard. Yet, I also think Color Grey has done something even more special. They've created a game that's not 
like Return of the Ibudin, a game that exists in uncharted territory, a game that pushes the medium a little bit further. Hello there, thank you for watching. This is... I like how I, I keep it a bit more low-key towards the end, like how it's the secret club for the people who, who, who reach the end. Uh, thank you for watching, I know it's been a while, and I'm sorry, uh, but if this video is out and you're watching it, then that's very good, and also means that there are like three other videos uh, that didn't come out, <laughs> that might come out later on, we'll see. Uh, by the way, I'd be a bit remiss if I spent a not insignificant part of this video talking about Games Critics and the reviews of this game, and then not mention that Eurogamer's review of Golden Idol is really good, and talks about a lot of stuff uh, with the game's narrative and setting in a way that none of the other reviews did. Uh, so that's really cool. Good job, Eurogamer. If I had just read uh, the review before playing it, and not seen any of the other discourse found in the game, I don't think I would have had the problems that I had with it. Um, Alright, okay, that's it. Uh, thank you for watching. Goodbye.